Hi there. Welcome. My name's Kathy, and uh, I am with the Friends of Arlington's Planetarium. We're a nonprofit group that uh, was founded to help support the planetarium. Unfortunately, it's closed right now, but we are still here and we are still uh, trying to educate the public about science. Um, so in the meantime, we've been doing a lot of these online virtual presentations. And today we're very lucky to have Charity Southworth, who uh, is going to talk to us about volcanoes. So I am going to get right out of the way and let Charity tell us what we're here to hear about. So take it away, Charity. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Charity Southworth. A little background about myself. I actually uh, went to art school and switched to <laughs> studying astrophysics. Uh, in undergrad, I did a lot of different types of research in sciences. Um, I did a research on volcanoes, especially some super volcanoes in um, the southwest of the U.S. Did some radio astronomy as well. And then I went to grad school for informal science education, where I really like to use art as a way to get the general population interested in the sciences again. Um, and then through grad school, I actually worked at Planetarium here in Boston. Um, but right now I use my own business, the Science Boutique, uh, where I make a lot of science themed art, clothing, jewelry to um, try and get people to understand some more of the weirder concepts in science. Um, I'm also a NASA Solar System Ambassador, which means I do volunteer with NASA and they provide me with some really great resources uh, to bring out into the general population. So today's talk I have titled Volcanoes of the U.S. Uh, Geologic Cornucopia. Uh, I use the term cornucopia because we associate that with Thanksgiving, which of course that holiday does stem from uh, the pilgrims and Native Americans interacting. And I want to talk a little bit about how Native Americans interacted with volcanoes as well as how our current culture does, not just talking about the science behind volcanoes. All right, so I'm ready to go to the slides when you are, Kathy. All right. So I had my husband make this really cute cornucopia with volcanoes coming out of it. Um, sorry, I have a cat coming to my keyboard already. Uh, so there are generally four types of volcanoes. They can be broken down further, but for basic understanding, there are cinder cone volcanoes, composite volcanoes, shield volcanoes, and lava domes. A cinder cone volcano is built from lava ejected from a single vent, that central vent right there. They are the simplest of volcanoes. Then you have composite volcanoes. These are sometimes called stratovolcanoes. They typically have very steep sides. Some of the world's most iconic mountains are actually composite volcanoes. So think Mount Fuji, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens. The essential feature for a composite volcano is that conduit system of vents stemming from the magma chamber. So it's not a single vent, you have a lot of stuff going on. Then we have shield volcanoes, which are built from very fluid lava flows. So lava flow after lava flow builds up on the central and side vents too, to make this shield-like silhouette. This is like a shield. Uh, so Kilauea, which is on the main island of Hawaii, is a shield volcano. Then there's lava domes. Lava domes are really interesting, and I love visiting these. They are created by a mass of lava that just is too thick, that it just kind of bubbles out of the surface of the earth. And the outer edges of that magma or lava hardens before the inside does. So you have movement inside still that cracks the surface. So you just get this really jagged looking dome. Very, very interesting. So all four of those types of volcanoes exist within the US. However, there's also different types of eruptions from each type of volcano. So not every volcano is gonna erupt in the same way. 
You can have very large eruptions, you can have small eruptions. And instead of getting into what those are called, I'm just gonna tell you that the worst of them, the biggest one is called a Plinian eruption. And those usually come from those composite volcanoes. So something like Mount Fuji, Mount St. Helens, or from caldera volcanoes, like super volcanoes. So we see a lot of variation in eruption types from super volcanoes because they have like that one big one and then just a bunch of little things for millions of years. Um, so with a super volcano, you get something small like a little lava dome or you could have that Plinian eruption. Um, so different types of eruptions do create different volcanic landscapes. And that's what um, this next slide is gonna show you. But I want to stress that not every eruption is gonna have all these components. So a lot of volcanoes, when they erupt, you're not gonna have a mountain. So don't let the height of this graphic uh, kind of misconstrue you. Um, so to start, I wanna talk about femorals, these little things right here. Um, they were one of my favorite volcanic features. So what it is, it's gas, hot gas coming from the magma chamber to the surface. This is what creates hot springs. Also, you'll get um, gas vents. You can get sulfuric lakes or uh, what's called a tree kill zone, where this gas is actually, actually killing the roots of trees and causing the trees to die. So they're very, very interesting. Then you have something called a lahar, which is pictured here. So these are very dangerous. Uh, they're often thought of as mudslides, but they are more destructive. When a volcano that has a snow cap erupts, the snow melts and mixes with volcanic material, creating a river of water, debris, and it can flow at over 100 miles per hour. Then you have ash fall, lava flows, eruption columns. These are fairly familiar to people because they are very picturesque, easy to see. Uh, then there's lava bombs, which is characterized as a ball of lava that's about four inches in diameter or larger. Um, and they can happen during even more subdued eruptions, like some that you could see in Hawaii, uh, which is why it's just smart to stay away from any lava flows or <laughs> lava fountains. Uh, and then here we have pyroclastic flows, one of the most destructive components of um, certain volcanic eruptions. It is hot volcanic ash and rock. You're talking about over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit that is just traveling down the side of a volcano at over a hundred miles per hour. Uh, eventually over thousands and thousands of years, these flows do compress to create something called tuff. Um, and a lot of times that's where we get pumice stones. So pumice is quarried in the Southwest a lot because there's a lot of tuff from old pyroclastic flows from millions of years ago. All right. So now we're gonna be talking a lot about lava flows. We're gonna, I'm gonna tell you about the two different types of lava flows. This one is nice and ropey, very familiar. This type of lava is called pahoho, and this is a word of Hawaiian origin. Uh, this happens when you have um, more fluid lava flows. So think of something like Mount Doom when it erupted at the end of Return of the King. Uh, although I don't really know of any lava that is that fluid and moving that fast, but that's what Pahoho is like. Then you have Aa lava, which is really, really rocky. And this is, once again, a word of Hawaiian origin. It's literally Aa. Um, these flows are very viscous and thick. So just like with a lava dome where the outsides crack, you have slow moving lava that's hardening, but still moving underneath. So it gets really cracky. Uh, you don't want to walk on it. This is very jaggy and rocky. All right. So we're going to talk about the ring of fire. It is where most of the world's volcanoes are found. Same goes for the US. It's the whole um, ring around the Pacific Ocean. So this is a direct result of plate tectonics. 
We have a collision of tectonic plates under and around the Pacific Ocean that causes near constant earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. There's about a thousand active volcanoes within the Ring of Fire. And within the US, there is just under 200 active volcanoes. Most of them do line the West Coast and the Aleutian Islands up in Alaska. So this is the Aleutian Islands, and here's our West Coast. And you can see that's where a lot of our volcanoes are, those red dots. So we're going to focus on six volcanoes within the US. And I have them right here. First, Mount St. Helens in Washington. Yellowstone in Wyoming, the Long Valley Caldera in California, Sunset Crater in Arizona, Kilauea in Hawaii, and then Kasatoshi in Alaska. And we'll talk about this blue dot at the very end of the talk. Alrighty. So this is a very old picture of Mount St. Helens before 1980. It was often thought of as one of the most beautiful volcanoes because it had that perfect cone shape, which is not much different from Japan's Mount Fuji. But on May 18, 1980, after two months of earthquakes, the north side of the volcano collapsed, creating a monstrous lahar. Remember, that's that mudslide. And then we had a horizontal pyroclastic flow that kind of blew out the side of the mountain. And then you had the vertical eruption everybody knows that it's very 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 impressive ash from this plume was actually carried hundreds of miles away by the wind and unfortunately millions of trees were completely leveled by those pyroclastic flows and 57 people did lose their lives the physical impact of the eruption is incredible but the cultural impact of this eruption is absolutely monumental this historic event fundamentally changed the way that we saw volcanoes. Residents of the Pacific Northwest and the rest of the world gained such an appreciation for the destructive power of volcanoes. And it was also the first time in US history that a volcanic eruption of this sort was so visible. Pictures and videos of the eruption and aftermath were all over the news cycle for months. Also, it did create a whole new genre of movies in the 1990s. Uh, unfortunately, this did come from fear of volcanoes, uh, but despite the bad science in these movies, they did help to inspire a whole new generation of volcano scientists who are creating new technologies and new ways to monitor volcanoes. We also learned how to deal with the literal and metaphorical fallout from eruptions like these during the Mount St. Helens eruption. We learned how to go about safely closing roads and unsafe in infrastructure. New policies were put in place and Mount St. Helens itself became protected land to further scientific research. Mm -hmm. So from Mount St. Helens, we're gonna talk about Yellowstone because Yellowstone is often feared because there's all these articles out there saying it's going to erupt. Well, yeah, it's going to erupt again. But in geologic time, that could be millions and millions and millions of years from now. Uh, with a lot of the knowledge that we gained from the Mount St. Helens eruption, we're able to monitor the Yellowstone caldera so well. So looking at Yellowstone, this is pretty much how big that red line is, how big the magma chamber way below the surface is. Um, and you have some uh, fumarole activity, those, uh, those vents coming up, that's what Old Faithful comes from. Um, so there, there's a lot of volcanic activity, uh, but I want to note the research that's currently being done. Um, since, this is actually quite impressive, since 1973, there have been over 48,000 earthquakes in Yellowstone but more than half of them occur in clusters, so in little time clusters, which is very interesting. And some of the instruments that we have out there um, are not just seismographs. We have dozens of GPS systems that measure the rise and fall of land masses, which is really important. Uh, with the Mount St. Helens explosion, we actually, or eruption, we were able to see that there was a bulge on the side of the mountain and that is where the pyroclastic flow came from. 
So if we're able to see if there's any land rising or falling, we can know that magma is either coming up to the surface or moving away from that surface towards another part of the caldera. There are also lake level monitoring systems, uh, which are important because that can also track femoral activity. Uh, is Are the gases that are feeding into these geysers and lakes getting too hot and evaporating the water faster? Uh, so we know that there's some more action going on in the caldera. There's also satellite that's constantly mapping uh, the terrain looking for any changes. So it's probably one of the most monitored volcanoes on planet Earth. And Yellowstone won't erupt without any warning. Even Mount St. Helens, we did have a warning. We just didn't, we weren't, weren't able to read the signs yet. But here we'll definitely know if something's going to happen. So scientists are constantly taking what we learn from every eruption and applying it to Yellowstone. It's actually quite a safe volcano to be around. Uh, there is another super volcano in the US that not a lot of people know about, and that is the Long Valley Caldera. In this photo, the caldera is this region right here. This is near Mammoth Lakes in California. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in this area and I find it fascinating, not because it's a super volcano, uh, but because there are so many smaller volcanic landforms you can visit uh, and they provide really great resources to humans. So its last large eruption, its last Plinian eruption was about 760,000 years ago. Uh, but there are currently many fumaroles that provide geothermal heat to the surrounding area. So looking at this map that you can see, this is the whole caldera is the circle here. This resurgent dome is a um, little, just a little pop up in the middle of the caldera um, where we really do track if that gets bigger or smaller because if it gets bigger and bigger, that means that is moving up into that dome. Uh, we have some of those obsidian, lava domes I was talking about, some lakes that have um, sulfur in them. In Mammoth Mountain, we have a tree kill zone. We have hot springs all around this area. Uh, it's really quite interesting. Uh, so I want to talk about this geothermal plant. So the Casa Diablo hot springs and geothermal facility actually taps into the caldera's hydrothermal system. Uh, it goes a couple hundred feet below the ground and its annual output is 250 gigawatt hours. Um, and it's really important to note that the scientists at this plant keep track of the chemistry of all the water in the surrounding area to make sure that they're not influencing any changes. Also keep track of temperatures and make sure that whatever power they are taking isn't actually changing um, the geological makeup of the area. There are also a number of obsidian domes, and this is a picture of one with a person to scale, um, around Long Valley Caldera. Uh, obsidian is really great for making nice various tools and arrowheads. So the Mono Paiutes gathered this obsidian to make tools and arrow points. These are the Native Americans from this area. So this is a piece of obsidian, I'll put it right up here so you guys can see how shiny it is. Very easy to flake off. You can see some little points here, little ridges. So you can easily make something very sharp from this. Um, so they would use it to make tools, arrow points, but they would also carry unworked pieces, pieces like this big, very heavy. This stuff is just solid. They would carry it over the Sierra Nevada mountains to trade with other Native American groups. And we can actually find pieces of Manyo and Yo Obsidian, which is from Long Valley, um, all around California and even further north. Um, so it's pretty cool. And the trade routes that the Native Americans created, the physical trade routes, were eventually used in the 19th century during the, uh, the gold rush. There's a one of the bigger booming gold rush towns in the area is called Bodie, and it's a literal ghost town that you can go visit. So if you ever end up in this area, it's pretty cool to go see that. All right, so one part, this is a satellite view of the Long Valley area. Um, 
one thing that's really cool is the volcanoes aren't just right by the caldera. So you have the caldera over here. If you go a little bit north, you have more, you know, like Devil's Pose Pile, all these other little volcanoes, and then a lake called Mono Lake, uh, which is a natural saline soda lake. And these are, Lenega Island right here is actually a volcano, and Black Point is a volcano as well. And so this is really important to uh, California gulls because after they fly over the Sierra Nevada mountains, they stop here and they nest because Nega Island and Pahoa Island provide safety from coyotes. There's no way for coyotes to get to them. So they can actually nest there before they then continue migrating. However, in the California water wars in the early 1900s, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power purchased large parts of lands within this area so they could control the water rights. And uh, in 1941, they started to divert water from the area. And this caused Mono Lake to lose 69% of its surface area and drop 45 feet. So it actually made Nugget Island into a peninsula. So coyotes could go across to the island and uh, essentially eat the bird's eggs. Um, so in 1977, there was finally an ecological study published on the dangers posed by the diversion. And the Mona Lake Committee was formed and eventually worked really hard to get it restored to a higher uh, level. It still is not perfect. This is a picture I took in 2011. Uh, and you can see Neg Island right here. It could still become a peninsula. This was taken in June. Um, so this is one of that pretty high level. So there's still Mono uh, Lake Committee is still working hard to keep the level up high. This um, dark bit right here, this is the, the Nega Island. Um, it was actually in a movie as a full-size volcano. The movie's called Fair Wind to Java from 1953. So they just filmed it like and had little miniatures. So uh, it looked like a, a full-size volcano, which is pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna move a little bit east now and talk about Sunset Crater which is in the San Francisco peaks around Flagstaff, Arizona. There are numerous cinder cone volcanoes and lava flows in this area, but the most recent volcanic eruption is what created Sunset Crater. It's called Sunset Crater because of the colors of its, um, I'll say soil for lack of a better term, but cinders at the top. Um, so this is a cinder cone. That means it just had a lot of stuff kind of coming out of one single vent. And this erupted in 1100, so not a long time ago. Native Americans had been living in the area for at least a few hundred years before this eruption even occurred. Uh, we don't know what these tribes called themselves, but archaeologists refer to them as the Sinagua. Uh, so they were a farming culture. They lived in pit houses. They had pueblos as meeting and storage places. They were not travelers. They were very rooted in this area. So I'm gonna show you another picture. This is the Bonita Lava Flow, just same area, Sunset Crater, and you can see a couple more older cinder cones in the background here. And this is a lava flow um, that's very similar to that ah uh -uh lava that I was talking about, but there's snow on it, which is always a little weird. Um, so we're gonna talk about this really cool Pueblo. When Sunset Crater erupted, we think that the Sinagua actually had enough warning because there's no evidence that anybody perished from the eruption. We have found pit houses that date to before the eruption with absolutely no bodies in them, but you do find that they're burned or they have cinders from a volcano in them. So they were abandoned. And the Sinagua moved down the mountain about 20 miles towards older cinder cones that actually had made the local soil very fertile. So this is the Wupatki Pueblo. It is near a uh, cinder cone called the Duni Mountain right here. Uh, very, very good soil for farming. They inhabited this area for about 100 years after the eruption of Sunset Crater. And this Pueblo itself would have had about 100 rooms along with a community room and a ball court. 
And they would have used this for storage. They would store water, they would store grain, um, they would use it meeting houses, evidence that they made tools within it is very, very impressive. We don't know why they left, um, but they did eventually leave. And these are the ancestors of uh, tribes such as the Hopi, which are also in the Northern Arizona area. So even though this area was shown to be volcanically active, it did not deter the Tanagua from staying in the area. And they were able to thrive and use the volcanoes to their advantage. And I think that is a common theme throughout human history. Volcanoes are very important to us. And I think probably the best example of that um, is within Hawaii. They have, a, well, the ancient Hawaiians and current Hawaiians have a remor remarkable, absolutely remarkable relationship between volcanoes. Uh, the whole chain of the Hawaiian islands are made from a volcanic hotspot, which means that the Pacific tectonic plate is moving over a hotspot, essentially, that's feeding magma. Um, so the only active volcanoes are on the big island of Hawaii, although it is possible that Maui could see one last eruption. So the hot spot in the middle of the Pacific plate is not just responsible for Hawaii, but it's responsible for an almost 4,000 mile chain of seamounts, atolls, and islands. Atolls are kind of like a sunken island where all you see are the very like highest points. Um, Midway Island is also part of this chain. And this chain of seamounts reaches all the way up to Russia and the Aleutian Islands. This is Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. What's really interesting is the hot spot almost seems to have turned at some point. There's a 60 degree angle here. So the theory of hot spots was first proposed in 1960s and was widely accepted. But more recently, there was a study of this it's called the Hawaiian Emperor Chain, noting this 60 degree shift. The conclusion is that hot spots are also mobile under Earth's crust. So uh, you can have the shift of a hot spot movement as well. That's baffling to me. So you have two things moving, which is really interesting. All right. Charity, did you uh, want to take questions at the end? You have a question in the chat. I do. Right now, oh, it says, um, Jennifer wants to know, what distinguishes a super volcano from a mere volcano? So a super volcano is where you're gonna have that explosivity. Uh, that's all about the type of eruption that comes from it, not necessarily if it's a cinder cone or a shadow volcano. Most super volcanoes are actually calderas. You can't really tell that they're there um, because they had a very big eruption in the past, collapsed down on themselves, and it's just kind of like brewing underneath. Um, so to categorize it, you have to, to be a super volcano, you have to have had an eruption that uh, covered a certain amount of area. And there aren't that many of them. Um, you had a lot, you know, during, I would say, the Pleistocene, dinosaur times, there was a couple of super volcanoes down in Mexico, um, but they don't erupt that often. Um, there is a caldera near Naples, Italy, but it's not quite a super volcano, it didn't cover enough land. So if, if uh, uh, Pompeii, what's that volcano? Vesuvius. If Vesuvius isn't a super volcano, think it's like, wow, it must be a really big eruption. Um, it would be something that would cover something like the size of Arizona. Yeah. So it's all about the explosivity of an eruption, not necessarily its structure itself. It's a very hard term. I don't, I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> so Hawaii, for instance, is not a super volcano. And none of these volcanoes that you see here are. Um, most of the ring of fire volcanoes, because they do come straight from plate tectonics, they don't have the time to really build up to be so explosive. 
because they're they're going to be erupting so much more often. Uh, so it's safe to say that then these ones all throughout Polynesia, um, some in Japan, Russia, Alaska, aren't super volcanoes. They're usually in the middle of a plate, which is counterintuitive to volcanoes. Um, so showing how the hot spot works, which is a little different. Um, because you have a mantle moving over it, for instance, if we had a hot spot and the mantle wasn't moving at all, we would probably have a super volcano because it would build up, build up, and explode in a huge Plinian eruption. Um, but here, since we have the motion of the plate moving constantly, and then we know that the hot spot is also kind of moving, uh, we get this gradual buildup of land. Uh, now, the Pacific plate actually moves at 2.75 centimeters or inches a year, which is the same rate that your nails grow, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and then we're going to talk about just one specific volcano, but I do want to mention that right here, about 22 miles south of the big island, uh, is the new Hawaiian island that's already being created. It's a kilometer high already. It's called Loihi, uh, but it is also still a kilometer under the surface of the ocean. So it's going to be a while till we actually see that as an island. All right. On this one. So we're going to talk about Kilauea, which is on the southern part of the big island, Hawaii. Uh, it is a very active volcano. It has a lava lake and lava flows that extend all the way to the ocean. Uh, the Pu'u'u'u eruption at Kilauea began in 1983. You had lava fountains, lava flows throughout the whole area practically constantly. The eruption was actually so consistent and predictable that you could go on a tour boat that would go to where the lava was pouring into the ocean. Uh, you could even take helicopter tours of lava. You could enter the national park and watch lava fountains. It was not a particularly violent eruption, but it was a long and consistent one. Until March of 2018, the USGS discovered uh, that increase in pressure within the magma system. So we have a lot of pressure sensors when we're studying volcanoes. The summit of the Kilauea uh, volcano also started to inflate and the lava lake there began to rise significantly, which, you know, we knew it was a sign of something was gonna happen, but yet tourists kept coming into the park to see the lake overflow. Uh, but scientists did stay vigilant with their monitoring, knowing that these changes could not be ignored. Because we had a pretty significant event. End of April, the summit of the volcano collapsed, which actually signifies the end of its 35 year eruption. Then two days after this, the lava lake at Kilauea started to drop and drain out. And a few days later, a fissure opened up in a residential area called the Lilani Estates. And over the course of two months, 14 square miles of land was covered. It destroyed 700 homes and 30 miles of road. Yeah, but it was predictable. We saw it coming, people were evacuated. Uh, but during the first uh, days of the fissure opening, the island was hit with a 6.9 magnitude earthquake. And as more of the magma drained away from that lava lake, the summit of the Kilauea volcano, the ground of the summit would collapse and it would release a plume of ash. And this would happen every 28 hours for months. It's incredible. But we're going to look at a little bit more of what was happening because it was so predictable. Uh, and scientists were like, hey, don't go here. Stay away from there. People could still go golfing even with this ash plume in the background. Uh, there were some injuries reported, uh, people who uh, got a little bit too close and did get hit with some lava bombs or a um, little bit of lava spray, but not many at all. And they shouldn't have been where they were. All right, and we can look at, this is the before and after of the summit, the lava lake. You can see before it had some lava in there, it would only glow really at night and then it completely collapsed. 
And then this is the coverage uh, from the fissure that opened in the Lani Estates, which is quite far away from the summit of the volcano. It covered a lot of ground in a very short time. Um, so after this, Kilauea was quiet for a little bit until uh, just before Christmas this past year, that lava lake started filling up again. And so um, Kilauea is now active again, uh, which is quite predictable because uh, there's always been activity within Hawaii and ancient Hawaiians knew this. They were very aware of the landforms. So this is a um, painting by um, Herb Kane, who has amazing paintings of uh, big blues. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll discuss it. Um, so for uh, Herb Kane uh, has some amazing paintings from Hawaiian mythology as well as just history. Um, ancient Hawaiians were very aware of the increasing age of volcanoes throughout the island chain. So the northern most islands are the older islands, older volcanoes. Um, and I think it's the volatile state between volcanoes and the sea was a major element in Hawaiian mythology and it was embodied in Pele, the deity of volcanoes. So this is Pele. So Pele was born to the female spirit Haumea, who descended from what we would consider to be Mother Earth. Um, and she did have a sister. According to the myth, uh, Pele originally lived on Kauai. Oh, sorry, I always say it that way. Kauai. And her older sister, Namaka, was the goddess of the sea. And she attacked her. So Pele fled to the southern island of Oahu. And then her sister forced her to flee again. So she goes south to Maui. And then finally to the big island, Hawaii. There she lives within the Kilauea summit. There she is safe because the slopes of the volcano are so high that even Namaka's mighty waves could not reach her. I find this mythology fascinating because it's the science of the Hawaiian islands volcano chain. It alludes to an internal struggle between volcanic islands and ocean waves, and it's incredibly consistent with the geological evidence about the ages of the islands and shows, shows that the ancient Hawaiians had a very vast understanding of the land that they occupied. All right, so we have one more active volcano to talk about, and that is just north of the Hawaiian emperor chain, which you can see here. We have the Aleutian Islands. There are 57 volcanoes, active volcanoes in the Aleutian Islands, um, and they sit on the northernmost part of the Ring of Fire. And uh, these islands are part of Alaska. There are a few over here that are part of Russia. Okay, I'll talk about Yellowstone later. Um, so these volcanoes are actually so active. There is one, it's called, which always reminds me of the words like seisma, but it's semi sopokonoi that just erupted on Thursday and still em emitting ash. Um, and one eruption from this uh, island chain is very interesting. I think it affected our country in some profound ways. So in 2008, this is an island called Katatochi. There was no monitoring devices on this island. So it erupted on August 7, 2008 with absolutely no warning. Uh, and this was a very explosive eruption. It sent an ash plume as high as 45,000 feet. No one lived on the island, uh, but there were two scientists that did evacuate safely. Um, however, there are islands in the area that are populated. You have Attic Island, which is, uh, it's spelled different here, um, has about 300 residents and they received six centimeters of ash fall. No one was injured, but it did have a big effect on aviation. This is a map of the sulfuric dioxide clouds that were formed because, from this eruption in the Aleutian Islands by Alaska. Sulfur dioxide clouds are a huge aviation hazard and you can see that they really made their way throughout the US all the way to the Eastern seaboard. So it's important to monitor volcanoes also 
for aviation purposes. Just put a nice pretty picture of Mount Rainier for a moment. Um, the point is that there are many ways that they affect us. Yes, volcanoes are dangerous, of course, but they are vital for our existence. They create fertile soil and over time allow us to grow amazing crops. Even areas destroyed by pyroclastic flows like Mount St. Helens are already starting to show growth again. Every new eruption helps us also predict future ones. So we make huge leaps in the science and technology so that we can monitor bigger volcanoes like Yellowstone uh, and also really active ones like Kilauea. And I think it's important to note that humans have long coexisted with volcanoes, um, especially in the Southwest where a lot of ancient dwellings are so well preserved because it's a desert-like environment. We can see all the different ways that we traded different volcanic materials throughout the US and how we used it. Uh, so my whole idea is for people not to be so fearful of volcanoes, but instead respect their power. And I think one of the, like, the better examples of this in pop culture would probably be in the movie Moana, where they show like um, the, the goddess that's the volcano and she's all angry and everything, but turns out that, oh no, she's really turning into a fertile island. Um, and that comes from Polynesian culture, which is also a Hawaiian culture. Um, so just respecting its destruction and knowing that it's gonna turn into something beautiful someday, I think is pretty cool and fascinating. Um, one more volcano I wanna talk about is Trimble Knob. This is a uh, conical hill surrounded by farmland in Highland County, Virginia. So it's composed of basalt, which is volcanic rock, but it would have last erupted 35 million years ago. But it is there, even in Virginia. There's a couple of volcanoes about that age in Virginia. Um, although when it erupted, it probably wasn't Virginia because of plate tectonics. Uh, but there are some pretty old volcanoes on the eastern seaboard, just not any active ones. All right, I'll throw up these image references here and talk about Yellowstone a little more. Um, the effects of Yellowstone. Uh, that is a widely uh, varied topic, depending who you talk to about it. Um, I would say you would get ash fall coming to the East Coast. The biggest hazard would be the sulfur dioxide clouds. You would have travel completely stalled um, for quite a few months, and we would see a significant climate um, changes. Uh, but I mean, personally think we're kind of already, and we've seen travel being stalled for a few months. So, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I would say mostly it would affect Wyoming and over to just around the Mississippi. Uh, but for once, the people in the Cascades wouldn't be too affected by a volcano erupting. <laughs> All right. Um, we don't have any more questions right now in the chat. Um, could you talk a little bit? I know it's not a U.S. volcano, but of course, the one of the most famous eruptions in modern in the modern era is that of Krakatoa. Oh um, yeah. Can you um, sort of compare that with some of the other eruptions that we've been seeing in the last century or so? So Krakatoa, I think the reason why it I mean it's terrible eruption. Um, but it's so bad because people were around there. Um, you can get similar, um, explosivity in the ring of fire, um, up in the Aleutian mountains. The, you know how earthquakes, when you go from like a six on the Richter scale to a seven, it's like such a huge difference. It's the same with volcanoes. When you go from a six to a seven, it's like that one the exponential stuff. It's hard to understand. Um, I think Krakatoa would be harder to happen now because of our monitoring. You know, we're not 1800s anymore. Um, we tend to try not to have 
a lot of inhabitants so close to imminent threats. Um, although Mount Rainier and Seattle, <laughs> there's that right there. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know what the explosivity index was on that, um, but I do believe it did have a caldera. So that's, um, it wasn't a quite super volcano, um, but it's pretty high up there. I think it might've been a six. Yeah, almost as, and then the, Uh, this past one, yep, it was a six. There you go. There, yeah. That's my volcanic gut saying it should be a six. Um, I think Krakatoa is way worse than Mount St. Helens. Absolutely. Um, Mount St. Helens, reason why that was so bad was because it came out the side. Um, I think if it hadn't, uh, it just, really concentrated the force whereas Krakatoa um it was uh let's see it was just kind of like eruption after eruption after eruption until you had like that big one and um it's I, I find it unfortunate that the prediction wasn't better um but I I can only really speak to like what the USGS does within the US. Um, I'm not, I don't know about other countries and how well their monitoring is funded. So Steve also asks about Iceland and I'm also interested, I'm, you keep seeing pictures of people, you know, playing volleyball with, uh, you know, with the uh, lava flows just in the background. Doesn't that seem risky? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually recently saw that. I'm like, oh no. Don't do that uh, because like the, the, those lava bombs, you have just something like this big, all of a sudden it just shoots out and that's, you don't want to be hit by that. Um, so is the, the type of eruption in Iceland less violent? Is that why people are able to get away with that? There's actually a type of eruption that's specific to Iceland. Um, it's not so much that it's less violent. It's a lot of the lava bombs do have to do with like the gaseous, content in the lava um and that's not so much uh concern in iceland but we did have that eruption oh gosh and i can never say the name of that volcano <laughs> that um did create all those sulfur dioxide clouds and then europe had to like ground a bunch of flights so you do still get some violent eruptions in iceland um and as much as i would love to just go and watch lava i would never be that close to a lava fountain without proper gear at least. What um what what are some of the risks? Is, is there a lot of risk of um gases as well from eruptions? Oh yeah. You see you see volcanologists with you know all this protective gear on a lot of times when they're close to volcanoes. Oh yeah, there's um so like it, at Kilauea, there's not too much concern with the gases coming out of the vents there because of the composition of the magma. Uh, but if you go to um, places in Italy, uh, Stromboli, for instance, there's times where you just can't even go to Stromboli because there's too much gas being emitted, too much sulfur dioxide, that it's, it's not safe for you to breathe there. Um, and so those fumaroles are always a concern. Um, even in a place like Yellowstone, you know, those fumaroles are creating all those really beautiful colors that you see. It's like sulfur that's making the yellow and green and the beautiful blue water. But yeah, that's from gases. <laughs> yeah. Volcanic impacts on climate are huge. Um, so you get the it does make changes in the ozone um when you get those really really high up plumes i mean you're talking stratosphere uh and it's not just ash there's gases within it as well uh, especially when you have um plinian eruptions those really big eruptions um so yeah year without a summer that makes sense 
uh, you could have kind of just the long winter with gray skies. I mean, if you've ever seen Dante's Peak, it's like a very like bad science movie, but like the visuals of it are good at least of um, seeing like what it might look like with having um, clouds with uh, volcanic particles in them for the next like month. So you did show that there was, um, there were volcanoes. We're located um, on in the East Coast in Virginia. And um, are there any active volcanoes in the Eastern part of the United States at this point? No. Nope. <laughs> the like Eastern most active one would be Yellowstone and that's very, very West. Um, and a lot of it, it just has to do with how the plates have moved over time and um the likely this volcano in virginia likely came from when the plate for the atlantic was created um so yeah that's we just don't have a subduction zone but it's weird that you can just go over to fly five hour flight well at least for me five hour flight to iceland then you could see some volcanoes Okay, well, if unless we have any more questions coming in the chat. I'm not seeing anything. Do you have any uh, final uh, final comments, Charity? We really want to thank you for uh, giving this talk today. I just, it's fun to think of like, oh, what if this happened and just big eruption. Um, but I just urge people to like, maybe look at what good have the volcanoes done? Cause that's really fun to do. Uh, if you compare the South part of the big Island of Hawaii to the northernmost Island, Niihau, you're just, it's like, it's crazy what volcanoes do to earth. They create earth. That's how most of the land has, has been formed. Uh, we just need to learn to adapt to those big, uh, really plinian destructive eruptions. And we will. For humans, we adapt very well. <laughs> so do you have any uh, any recommendations for people who want to learn more about volcanoes? Any particular um, places they should go to find out more? I would say I like starting from a mythology point of view, an archaeological point of view. Um, any Polynesian culture, uh, mythology pertaining to uh, volcanoes, and then also just researching different tools that were made throughout all of the Southwest into Mexico. Um, it's really interesting what they were able to create with uh, different uh, volcanic material. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Charity, thank for you. giving this talk. We hope that we can get you to come back and talk again. Oh, yeah, definitely. I just... I love everything about science. <laughs> so do we. Uh, thanks again. And uh, until next time, uh, we hope that you'll uh, keep, uh, keep your eye out for more uh, talks and presentations from the Friends of the Planetarium. So long for now. Thank you.